watched a video by a certain user called Freedom of Speech that enlightened me to a, like, seriously, a mind-numbingly stupid policy held by the U.S. government. I know, I know, which stupid pos uh, policy could it possibly be? There are so many to choose from. Well, first off, I'll let you listen to this little clip from Barack Obama, since it pretty well centers around the issue that has drawn my anger for today. My administration has developed the first comprehensive national HIV AIDS strategy for the United States and increased funding to fight HIV AIDS around the world to record levels. Now, of course, superficially, that sounds fantastic. I mean, HIV is a serious global health issue that is killing millions of people. I mean, what could be wrong with that, right? Well, lots if that program in part is dedicated to promoting male circumcision as some sort of method of HIV prevention. So, just, just to give you an idea, let's go into a little bit of a history on that claim. So this concept has been kicking around since about 1986. Uh, it was based on a hypothesized biological mechanism that related inner foreskin cell morphology um, to higher susceptibility of HIV infection. These supposed biological mechanisms were coupled with what had been called observable evidence, which is pretty much fancy talk for, let's assume that correlation and causation are the same thing. Essentially, the correlation between high circumcision rates and low HIV infection, and vice versa, were held as, up as evidence that circumcision basically prevents HIV infection. Clinical trials were eventually done in Uganda, Kenya, and South Africa between 2002 and 2003. Those trials were also extremely flawed. To start, Uganda had a much lower infection rate among circumcised males. However, the study also included older men, which was not based, consistent with the other trials that were held. Plus, the overall infection rate in Uganda was low to begin with. Not only that, but different trials showed different levels of efficacy. Kenya and Uganda had little evidence of HIV prevention in circumcised males until 6 to 12 months, whereas South African trials showed efficacy in 1 to 3 months. All in all, this suggests that there are other variables at play here, since the efficacy is not consistent, which is what you would expect if circumcision alone was responsible for reducing HIV infection risk. The efficacy should be consistent if you've successfully eliminated all other variables. Now that that's out of the way, let's get into why I'm actually ticked off about this. If the people who designed this program took just a couple of minutes to look up the relevant literature from a database such as PubMed, they would have quickly realized that this claim is controversial at best, and junk pseudoscience on par with autism being linked to vaccines at worst. There was a lot of literature um, citing the original trials, some of which seem hesitantly su uh, supportive of the findings after mentioning numerous flaws while others, like the one I'll be citing, basically tear the original trials apart. The paper is called Male Circumcision and HIV Prevention, Insufficient Evidence and Neglected External Validity, which is published in the American Journal of Preventive Medicine in November of this year. Uh, right out of the gate, it mentions issues with the trial setup. These issues include, but are not limited to the following. Far more participants did not come in for the follow-up consults than actually contracted HIV. 23 of the 69 men who contracted HIV in the South African study and 16 of the 67 HIV-positive men in the Uganda trial contracted HIV from other non-sexual sources. And men who participated in the study also received sexual health counseling and free condoms, which would of course explain the differences observed in circumcision efficacy. There's too much going on here to adequately tease apart any real relationship between circumcision and HIV infection, if such a relationship even exists at all. Not only that, but there's also a large body of evidence out there that uh, contradicts the original set of trial results. Another analysis actually showed that circumcision in sub-Saharan men is not actually associated with reduced HIV prevalence. So if you remember that whole correlation that this entire thing was pretty much based on, Basically, this uh, study showed that that correlation doesn't even really exist. Um, another study in South Africa independently concluded that, and I quote, circumcision had no protective effect on HIV transmission. And another little interesting tidbit, uh, both U.S. and sub-Saharan men have relatively high 
HIV uh, infection rates and actually interestingly enough high rates of circumcision with approximately 75 percent of US men and about 70 percent of sub-Saharan men being circumcised some of you may have noticed that the impact of male circumcision on a certain segment of the population wasn't even addressed in the original trials that's right women and the possible implications male circumcision might have on them were totally neglected in the studies now the connection may not seem immediately obvious but that's pretty much the reason I'm making this video or one of the reasons anyway you see male circumcision may actually increase the risk of HIV infection in women and men for that matter one way this happens is that men who have the procedure done are more often than not under the impression that they are now immune to HIV and as a result they choose not to use condoms the paper that I'm basically pulling this all from brings up three extremely important issues with regards to changes in human behavior as a result of male circumcision how many of these programs result in behavioral changes like less frequent condom use what's to be done about the sidelining of women when male circumcision is used as a preventative method and people tend to be unwarranted um, or at least give unwarranted confidence in a technical fix when what is really needed is a bit of human restraint in the form of condom use and other safe sex practices now when I say people I mean both men and women here both men and women in these studies seem to basically feel that they're now immune to this d disease and are no longer concerned about it which clearly isn't the case since even the original trials said it only was sixty percent effective anyway another big issue I have with this whole thing is that a lot of people talk about circumcision as if it's some run-of-the-mill fail-safe procedure what is happening in Africa right now is the promotion of male circumcision in adolescents and adult males as well as in infants a study by the World Health Organization in 2008 found that 24 percent of ritualistic circumcisions and 19 percent of clinical circumcisions in adult males had not healed after 60 days out of all of those circumcisions 35 percent of the traditional and 18 percent of the clinical procedures resulted in complications even the original trials admitted that there were unacceptably high levels of complications even under basically optimal clinical settings these complications can be anything from mild swelling and bleeding to hematomas sepsis and even death did I mention that HIV can also be transmitted through pro improperly sterilized circumcision equipment don't even get me started on the BS about infant circumcision being okay either all physiological and physical evidence points to infants being in high levels of pain as a result of the procedure I haven't even been able to scratch the surface of issues surrounding male sexual health and decreased sensitivity I mean all of these complications and pain for a procedure that might help reduce the HIV risk somewhat but probably doesn't circumcision isn't even financially effective supplying free condoms is 95 times more cost effective than male circumcision a mathematical modeling analysis showed that cost effectiveness of male circumcision is lagging way behind more effective preventative methods like condom use and antiretroviral therapy in fact this paper rightly points out that circumcision is a multi-billion dollar industry that is ingrained within western culture it isn't unreasonable to be concerned with cultural biases promoting this procedure a Cochrane review stated circumcision practices are largely culturally determined so there are strong beliefs and opinions surrounding them it is important to acknowledge that researchers personal biases and dominant circumcision practices of their respective countries may influence interpretation of findings. so there you have it I know it probably doesn't matter to a lot of you but I have serious issues when people misuse science to promote things like this um, hope this didn't bore you all too much, and hopefully I'll have something more interesting for you guys on the horizon. See you guys later.